Snooker is a game of precision and concentration. It's difficult to master and can take years of practice to perfect, but not for 12-year-old Oliver Sykes. The young potter from the English county of Hampshire is already well on his way to a successful career in the sport. I'd love to be a professional and play on telly and play against professionals like Ronnie or Trump. Oliver began playing just before his eighth birthday. After taking on his older brother at his local snooker hall, his family could see the potential in him. They enlisted the help of highly renowned world snooker coach Tim Dunkley, who is known for working with young players. He's got a lot of natural talent and he's progressed a, progressed a lot faster than most of the other youngsters here. And from a very early age, from the age of eight, he was obviously going to be a very good player. He's at the level of, of the top players um, at a younger age. So he's playing at the standard that the 16 and 17 year olds are at the age of 12. After he began working with Tim, Oliver started winning matches in his local league. Up against much older players, he won a record five titles in the league. I was quite anxious at the start, but then when you get used to playing them, you feel like you can beat them and you know how to play against them. And then, well, at the start, I had my family all around the table helping me with like the points and stuff. And now it's just automatic. Oliver has an impressive ability to pull off an array of difficult pots. So much so that he's earned himself the nickname, The Sniper. The classy left-hander also has a knack for getting himself out of tricky situations on the table. His, his temperament, his mental strength is excellent. Um, for a 12-year-old to have temperament around the table and the strength that he's got is tremendous. Um, it doesn't matter who he's playing, he plays the same way and he's got the same attitude around the table. Um, he beats himself up when he loses, okay, but that's, um, that perhaps shows how determined he is. He's got the focus that a professional would have at the age of 12. He's only a little kid. Oliver's dad, Dean, tells us more. And Oliver will get it in time after time after time and it gets the other player quite demoralised really because they can't put the ball safe anywhere on the table without him getting it in. I'm always looking for new strategies and then like picking like the right shot, which what I think to do, and then I'll play it and then hopefully it goes in. Last season, Oliver finished second in the Southern Division of the Regional Junior Tour. It's a result which means that he automatically qualifies for the Premier Junior Tour, where he will be the youngest player competing on the national circuit for the country's best under-21s. After recently racking up a new practice high break of 117, the 12-year-old is well on his way to emulating his favorite player. I like Judge Trump because he does He's a really good player, all-around player, and he does lots of good trick shots at the end of the matches, and he's always been a great player to watch on TV. Away from the table, Oliver enjoys playing football with his dad. Sometimes I like, I like to get away with, from snooker, because like, I do lots of tournaments sometimes every week, so then sometimes I take a break a little while, do something different, like badminton or tennis or something like that, and then I'll come back and play. Having been selected to play for England at the Home Internationals in Leeds, Oliver will be practicing hard to make sure his game is in top shape. And honestly, to play for England under 16, it's amazing to be with one of my friends as well, Jamie Wilson. And Aidan Murphy. It's like, it's gonna be so fun to have a week in Leeds, almost like a holiday. I'm really, really proud of him. It's not really sunk in, sort of, um, properly yet. Yeah, I'm immensely proud of him, really. He, he deserves it because he, he 
just puts so much in and is so keen and enthusiastic in the sport. And um, yeah, he deserves everything he's, he's getting, really. If he can keep going and if he can keep progressing, then he can go as far as he wants to go. But it's very important not to look too far ahead. He just needs to keep looking at the next stage. I've watched him go through all his various milestones, like a first 50, like winning his first tournament, and each one is trem I'm tremendously proud of each one he passes. Um, then, of course, getting his evening call up. I mean, you can't get prouder than that. Dave, do you mind if we just borrow this practice table for two minutes, mate? We just need to film a link for, uh, for Bay's watch. You're joking. I'll, I'll play in the final in a minute, mate. Mate, it'll be two, uh, two minutes, honestly. Oh, be fine. No, cheers, a, cheers, cheers. Off. Come on. And look at this. The show is going global. We've been to Riga in Latvia. We're in Yushan here in China. And we're going back to Firth in Germany for the Bull Ones Classic. It's been a big month for the World Snooker Tour. And it's a big show coming up. This is Bay's watch. What are you doing? What? Here's what's coming up on the show. With China looking to build an entire city dedicated to snooker, we drop by to see what's going on. Meet one of the fastest emerging names in women's snooker. Catch up with the boss, Barry Hearn, as he hits 70, looking back on an incredible career and an even bigger party. And finally, our Riga Masters champion takes on the great British breakoff. Before we get stuck into it, here's a roundup of all the action on the table from the last month. Last month, we were in the beautiful capital of Latvia for the Kaspersky Riga Masters. Neil Robertson won the first ranking title of the season, beating Jack Lazowski 5 2 in the final. And last week, Germany hosted the Pool Hunter Classic. Kyron Wilson lifting the trophy after a 4 2 final win over Peter Ebden. But before that, the tour headed east for the Yushan World Open, and David Gilbert looks set for his first ranking crown when he led 9-5 in the final, only for Mark Williams to fight back and win 10-9. Another piece of silverware for Willow's caravan mantelpiece. And whilst we're in Yushan, you might be wondering why I'm wearing a hard hat. Well, we couldn't not visit this place. This site is going to be the home of the new international snooker city, the world's first. The site behind us is going to be the venue for the new World Open. It's going to be a new snooker museum and a brand new snooker academy. Should we just, should we just interview someone here? Is that going to be easier? Yeah, good idea. What about that guy over there in the blue shirt? Excuse me, do, do you work here? Uh, yeah, uh, listen, my, my shift's only just started. I've got a lot to do, as you can see. This look, Jason Ferguson for WPBSA. How are you, mate? This was not in the jobs description, building. <laughs> so just tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Well, we're excited to be here, of course. Uh, Yushan County. You know, being from sport, you can't help but admire ambition. You know, this city has ambition to be somebody. It's, it's a lower-tiered city, not like Beijing, Shanghai that we're used to, but the ambition is to build the Billy Sport capital of the world. 
How ambitious is that? And this site's going to be completely transformed, isn't it, from what we just saw on the model inside? Yes, and, and what we're stood on here, we're actually stood on uh, what is going to be a brand new venue, uh, up to 4,000 seats. It will be a multi-use venue, but it will be designed around snooker events, billiard sports events, so uh, very steep tiered uh, seating, uh, everything catered for that, that either players or the spectators would, would require. Uh, and and the, the whole site around what you see here is being transformed. Over there is going to be our brand new academy. And obviously this new tour goes all over the world, but a lot of people are wondering, why Yishan? Well, it, it's, it's funny, it, you know, it's not one of the big cities that everybody knows, like, like I said, but we're actually the thing that brought us here was actually our table manufacturers, Xingpai Star. Um, believe it or not, the blue slate, which is the, the real tough slate which is used on billiard tables, comes from Yushan Mountain. So that, that was really how we ended up here in the first place. They, they have factories here and uh, we've been coming here for a few, few years now. Uh, with some, it started with some pool events and then became our world ranking event, our world open for the third time. And uh, the whole idea has transformed from running an event to transforming a city. It's fantastic. And it's an incredible place, John, isn't it, as well? We can see the building behind us. This is going to be built by, it's now August. And they said by the end of October, this is going to be finished. I find that uh, we see this in so many cities as we travel across China. Uh, you know, the, the rate that things transform, the, the rate that things grow is, is just unbelievable. And, uh, and, and to think that that would, that would be ready in a few months' time is just unbelievable. And they're, they're also saying that this may even be ready for next year's World Open. Um, you know, and as you can see, it's a building site. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to do, mate, so I'll let you get back to it. So, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jason. Yeah, cheers. cheers. Thanks a lot. Go back to work. Lads, there's nowhere near enough cement here. This is a big job. And rumour has it, Jason is actually still there counting that cement. Poor bloke. Hang on, how can you got to do China and Riga? You shouldn't have got your holiday, mate. I mean, you got the qualifiers next week, mate. Don't worry about that. Coming up next on Bayes Watch, we're looking at another area of the game making some big progress. That's right, and the great thing about snooker is there are no barriers in terms of age, gender or nationality. We caught up with former ladies World Under 21 champion Emma Parker, who's been learning from the very best. Women's snooker has made a significant leap forward in recent years since our governing body, the WPBSA, has supported the World Women's Tour. There's more tournaments, more prize money and the chance to develop skills in a competitive environment. Snooker is one of few sports to allow men and women to compete together at professional level. Rianne Evans and Onyi compete on the sports secondary circuit, the Challenge Tour, and have competed for a place at the World Championship. The WPBSA has used a range of grassroots initiatives in recent years, both in the UK and overseas, and talented players such as former Under-21 world champion Emma Parker are starting to emerge. My dad used to play on a pool team, so I started playing pool with him, and then my uncle introduced me to snooker, and then it just went from there. Obviously it was my first year on tour, so I tried to get some trophies, and it drives me to win even more, so hopefully I can start winning some main events now and I've got them under my wing. They're all, all really nice girls, I talk to around quite a lot. It's all, it's all friendly, but I guess when you get on the table no one's really your friend, so... Parker's enjoyed great success already, climbing to world number 15 after an impressive rookie season. And it's no great surprise given her practice partners at Grove Snooker Academy include Ronnie O'Sullivan and Judd Trump. I practice with um, Ronnie quite a lot up here and he's given me tips in the past and just watching him play is such a pleasure. So I really do enjoy when he's up here and I feel like I play better when he's here. I don't know why, just um, get my arm going I guess. I just think he's brilliant at what he does and I think if anyone can get close to him then that's an achievement. I'd love to be at that level, you know, I'd love to be the best woman player in the world. Now, we all know Barry Hearn is a bit of a legend, isn't he? The World Snooker Chairman has been at the top of the sports industry for over 40 years. And right here on the grounds of Matchroom Towers, he celebrated his 70th birthday. The guy's still going strong. Next up on Bay's Watch, we caught up with the boss to take a look back on an incredible few decades. This pretty much guarantees our bonus, by the way, doesn't it? Cool. Well, Barry, thanks for speaking to us. We're just going to try and look back at your career in snooker, having just had your 70th mm. birthday. But mm. first of all, it was a rather extravagant celebration at your birthday <laughs> party. We had celebrities, Michael Buffer MC, you must have enjoyed that. Oh, I loved it. It was a great day and uh, yeah, it's a, a landmark birthday and I put 
my daughter Katie, Emily from Matra Multi Events, and my PA of 30 plus years, Michelle, in charge. And they didn't let me down. You know, it was a, uh, it was spectacular. And 360 people that I most wanted in the world to be there were there. So, yeah, thoroughly enjoyable, but a terrible hangover. It lasted about six days. I mean, <coughs> we got involved. It was a proper night. Uh, and. <laughs> Just kind of now going into to your career as, as mm. a whole, it started off, I suppose, by chance, really, didn't it? Because you, you were a textile dealer, and then, then you kind of, as a property investment, invested in some snooker holes, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it, I was the finance director for a, a, a textile company, so my brief was negotiating contracts pre predominantly. Uh, and then an opportunity came up to buy a chain of snooker halls, which I bought as the for the property value, really, more than snooker. I wasn't a snooker fan at that time. Uh, and then you had that little bit of luck, you know, suddenly the BBC started showing snooker on mainstream television. Everybody thought, well, this looks like a good game. The, the business exploded. And I started doing events to encourage more business. And the byproduct of that was Steve Davis walking in one day and saying, can I play in one of your tournaments? So fate's a strange thing. It deals you strange cards to play. But looking back on it, yeah, it was amazing what happened, you know, a once in a lifetime opportunity that I wasn't going to let pass. It was exciting, you know, and, and Steve just wanted to win and play. Um, but the other boys, when we had the matchroom eight players, you know, they were all a fundamental part of it as well. And they gave a lot of value They they learned how to entertain as well as play well. They learned to be characters and personalities and, and that put the sport where it is today really they laid the foundations for turning it into one of the nation's favorite armchair sports yeah, i mean there were some real characters uh, in in that uh matchroom mob I mean, mm. if, if you had to kind of pick out a story or a moment that you had with, with some oh, there's guys, thousands was... of stories i mean obviously most of the stories and most of my gray hairs re revolve around jimmy white you know and jimmy was just amazing because he was on another planet most of the time, you know, and he was so popular in Asia, they used to worship him. And then he'd disappear for a couple of days and I'd be like, where's he gone? I need him for a sponsor trip or a, to meet somebody. But the, my favorite was a guy in Hong Kong who was a big Jimmy White fan, took us out on his huge liner boat. And we parked outside this, uh, small island, a few hours outside Hong Kong. And they, he had a speedboat on the back towing it. And Jimmy said, can I have a go in your speedboat? Well, this guy would have given Jimmy his back teeth. He was in love with him. He said, of course, Jimmy, take my speedboat. And Jimmy took it out and flipped it over and sunk it. <laughs> and Jimmy turned around and said, sorry about that, mate. You know, tell us what I owe you. And I'm like, Jimmy, that, even in those days, that speedboat's like 50, 60, 100,000 pounds. Oh, blimey. And we all dived in and we're trying to right, you know, put the boat up and scoop everything. It was, it was chaos, but it was so much fun, you know. You couldn't, you couldn't look back and say, well, that was a quiet day. or Everything was a learning, you know. We were learning about life, we were learning about the sport, we were learning about different cultures. And it was a fascinating time in my life. Probably the most exciting time was the early days of snooker. If we were to fast forward, I know before, kind of prior to taking ownership of, of, of World Snooker, you, you were quite reluctant to, to get involved. What, what was it that sort of changed your mind? And, and I, it was clear I wasn't welcome in the snooker pa circles of power. Um, so you, you leave and you concentrate on people that wanted your services and your help. They didn't uh, until the time when the sport was in such a low point that the players, some of the players came to me and said, would you get involved again? And then I had to think, do I want that aggravation? Do I want to go backwards? And actually the answer was yes. I think I owe this sport something because it started me off. I enjoyed the sport and I was frustrated at the lack of progress the sport was making. And given where we are now with 25 events, 14 million pounds of prize mm. money this season, just how pleased are you? That you've yeah, done it's, it's always nice to be know, to know you're right. You know, it's always nice to be successful and numbers don't lie but the joy for me is that we haven't even started you know I think we've made a lot of progress um, some people don't understand long-term strategy planning which is something that I think I've always specialized in 
logistics are a key part of what I do, formats, structure. Uh, initially, they probably think you're mad, and then over the years, they suddenly realise that Bazza knows what he's talking about. And I do, you know, and uh, there's no point, you know, when you get to my age, you don't, you don't suffer modesty, you just tell the truth, you know, I'm the best in the world at what I do. And anyone who disagrees with me is wrong. So when you start off with that principle, the only way is up. And um, if, if we were to look forward and see where, where you could take snooker, if, if you're sort of snooker utopia, what would the world of snooker look like? I think, it's it about, I think it's mainly about respect for sport and sportsmen. And what we see in, in snooker is we're, we're on the journey of getting that perception of respect class. I suppose the golf model is the one I look at most and think, you know, my viewing figures on snooker dominate globally golf. And yet, the prize money in golf is a lot bigger and the perception of the sport is a lot better. So that's what we're working towards. And, you know, we, we had our first million pound prize money coming out of China this year, which is long overdue. I think that will escalate. But also, because we've structurally govern the game so well in the terms of filled the calendar, kept everybody busy. Now people that want to come into their new world of snooker have got to pay an asking price far beyond what we've used to. And finally, I just wanted to finish on talking about the fact that actually in May you were put into the Snooker Hall of Fame. Yeah. And, um, I know we, we don't often see you show your emotions, but you did uh, on yeah, stage there. Was, How much did it mean to you? It was peculiar because I never, I mean, obviously, we have board meetings where these things are discussed, so I'm going to sack all my directors because they must have had a board meeting without me. And I remember, you know, the Dorchester, they say we've got two inductions, and I'm thinking to myself, I remember Ding Jong Wee. Who's the other one? And, I, and, I, and it never actually, I, it's so stupid, because obviously I've, in the cold light of day, I think I'm going to get it sooner or later, you know. But it never occurred to me until Steve Davis got up and started talking. And then it was a little bit emotional just for a few seconds because this has been a big part of my life, you know, and I'm proud of what we've achieved. And I think we can do better. And I'm not going to stop. There's something very special about getting something from your peers, people that are involved in the game. You know, we all can be the tough guy. I don't care about other people. My opinion counts, etc., etc. The reality is, it's nice to have people say, well done. It doesn't happen very often. And when it happens in an occasion like that, it is emotional. Well, Barry, thanks for talking to us. I think there's a lot more exciting moments in your snooker career ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks. In last month's episode, we introduced you to a brand new challenge, the Great British Break-Off. And Ali Carter made a flying start, passing eight out of the possible 10 reds. That's right. And next up to the plate is newly crowned Riga Masters champion, Neil Robertson. So can the Thunder shoot down the captain, you get because of the pun and the flying pun thing. Uh, I thought it was alright. Anyway, let's get straight into it. This is the Great British Breakup. We haven't got the drone. What are you doing? What happened to the drone? We have this bit for that, no? No, no, no we used the budget all on Days Watch 5. <laughs> Practice. Oh, that looks pretty good, Joe. See, he's not coughing. Oh, 
And that is nearly all we've got time for this episode. Coming up next month. Mark Williams looks to defend his Sangsum Six Red World Championship title in Bangkok. Then it's time for a new look Shanghai Masters. Ronnie O'Sullivan will hope to defend his crown and become the winner of Snooker's richest ever invitational event. We then head south to skyscraping Guangzhou for the Evergrande China Championship where last year Luke Purcell became the first player from continental Europe to win a ranking title. And finally we return to Lommel for the D88.com European Masters. So which events are you doing mate? Uh, I am doing Guangzhou again actually, we're looking forward to that. Oh, really nice. good. Yeah. Nice. So I've got Shanghai? No, Roddy's doing Shanghai. Roddy's doing it? So which yeah. ones have I got? And that is all we've got time for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you again next month. Lewis, I'm not doing any events at all. Lewis. <laughs>